So today I'm going to be focusing mostly on my work uh, in Australia, um, weaving together work of looking at the early migration of people into the continent, and then looking at how people fit within their ecosystems. Um, as Tom mentioned, I do have a much uh, pretty broad uh, interest, but my interests are really understanding the ways that humans impact ecosystems and the ways that ecosystems impact humans from deep time until today. And so in this way, I really look at the ways that um, we can understand people as part of ecology. And this can help us to understand modern and future sustainability. Um, if you have any questions, my email is up there as well as you can tweet at me. Um, and so thank you very much. So today I'll be talking about these two approaches, modeling the deep past and modeling the more recent past. So we're going to begin by talking about using flow models to detect the peopling of Australia. So people are everywhere. We are from the tips of the African continent throughout Eurasia and throughout the Americas. We've even reached all the way down to Antarctica in recent times. But if we look in the ancient time, people got there by walking and by using boats, but mostly by using the power of our feet. When we are walking into these continents, we are using um, similar physiological capacity to reach the edges of Eurasia, to reach the edges of Australia, and even to reach the edges of North and South America. And so by understanding the ways that people move and the ways people conceptualize movement, we can understand quite a bit about our human capacity to be able to live in many different environments all throughout the ecosystems of the earth. So today I'll be talking about how people got through the continent of Sahul 70,000 years ago. So 70,000 years ago, Sahul looked very different than it does today. The world looked very different than it does today as a lot of oceanic water was trapped up in sea ice, exposing the shallower continental shelves. And so we end up having larger continents than we do today during that last glacial maximum. And a lot of what you see are the connecting of uh, land masses that we don't see today. For example, here in Sahul, we see that New Guinea, Tasmania, and a lot of the islands surrounding modern day Australia were connected to this supercontinent. So people arrived there, we know that they arrived there because of the rich Aboriginal cultures that were um, encountered at contact. But the question of how people moved throughout the continent and to a small degree when is still being debated. Now, people have been, been debating this peopling for a very long time. Um, Birdzell in the 50s suggested kind of an arrival and scatter process. Bowdler suggested hugging to the coasts. We know people got here. We just don't know how, and we're still debating this. And the idea of people coming to Sahul from Sunda is so big in the popular imagination that you can even buy a board game looking at the peopling of this region. So to give you an idea of what these look like, these are kind of a visualization of these verbal models this scatter process, this hugging the coastlines, this hugging the forest and moving throughout. So again, we know people are there because people were there when colonists arrived hundreds of years ago and people are still there and have rich, diverse ways of being. The question of how they move throughout, however, has been mostly verbal and conceptual models because it's very computationally expensive to look at the peopling of an entire continent. So keep that in the back of your mind as we move forward talking about how I approach the research that I'm going to show you. But first we're going to slide back to talking about uh, Northern summer, Southern winter of 2017, when I was fortunate enough to spend that time living among Mardu Aboriginal people in the Western desert of Australia. At the invitation of Doug and Rebecca Bird, who had been working there for about 15 years at that point, I was invited to come down to work on understanding the place of Mardu within the ecosystem and food webs of the Western Desert of Australia. 
um, mostly through understanding their burning practices. So Mardu people burn, uh, they burn these small scale fires and we'll talk more about this later in the talk. Um, and this is an important part of their interaction with the ecosystem. And so we wanted to understand the ways that Mardu are embedded within the food webs and trophic webs of the Western desert. So this video shows you some of that burning, but it also just shows you what the landscape of the Western desert looks like. It's kind of big, beautiful, and flat. Um, and it has challenges for walking through it. I spent time walking around the Western desert um, with Mardu and the birds. Um, and within that time, I became interested in some of the wayfinding practices because of a long-standing idea I had with my collaborator, Devin White, of trying to understand migration um, into larger spaces as a way to move forward with things like agent-based models. So I spent some time interviewing elders who had lived traditional nomadic lifeways until the mid-1960s to ask them about how they moved throughout the landscape. In asking them questions, I found that people look to the horizon for orienting themselves. When they're in unfamiliar landscapes or in landscapes that maybe it would be easy to choose one path or another, you're looking to those high points to make sure that you get to where you're going. People would try to camp at water nightly. They would carry around 10 kilos of water and other things, and women would lead the pack. So I'll get to each of these. Um, together uh, in a minute. But it's important that I was able to discover some of these rules of thumb, because when you have rules of thumb like these, you can use them with a model. So orienting yourself on a horizon, if I were to blindfold all of us and drop us somewhere, let's say in the deserts of New Mexico, and we'd wake up and have to find our way out, and we wouldn't know where we were, one of the things that we would do is we would look for large, tall spaces on the edges. Maybe you would want to climb up those so that you could orient where you were in space. Or maybe you would just use those as places to make sure that you can, can get to where you're going. When we're using compasses, we use those to um, point our directions so that we can continue on a direction. And this was a common theme among people who I asked about how they moved throughout the region. People also would carry, would make sure that they arrived at water sources in the night. Now, as a naive Westerner, I thought that water would be a limiting factor, but it wasn't. Um, according to the people who I spoke with, they have a rich um, knowledge base that they develop when they're very young of where all the water sources will be. So they're never surprised. They're able to get somewhere every night to make sure that they can get there and refill on water. It's food that's the limiting factor. They don't necessarily know exactly where a Wallaroo is going to be, but they do know when they're going to get to water sources. And so camping at water nightly, making sure you make it to um, springs, to rock holes was critical. Now in doing some of this research for today's presentation, I actually learned that the Saudi government has installed um, solar powered laser lights to guide people who are lost in the Al Juf region to water sources. So that at night, they can see these laser beams and they can know to walk to that places, which has been helpful in making sure that people do not get lost in the desert without water. So I found this quite fascinating that even in a very different place like this, making sure you can camp at water is critical. And this was only installed a couple of months ago. Now, even though people in the Western desert knew where water was, they would still make sure they carried water with them. They would carry up to around 10 kilos of water, which is quite a lot, but that's making sure that they and other people with them would have enough. And so if you know that you're going to be walking a very long distance between water sources, you want to make sure that you have enough to get you to where you're going. And finally, Women leading the pack is an important um, thing within a model because children, women, men, elderly, we all have different metabolic rates. And so women keeping people together, and sometimes men, they would say men would go off on forays for hunting a bustard or 
or something that would come back to the group. By keeping everyone together, we're essentially looking at a woman's metabolic rate. And so all of these can be built together for a model. So delving into the model, this is not my model, but it's an example of what a model can show you where we can look at the juxtaposition of the density of prob the probable density of people versus climatic events. So this is from Timmerman and Friedrich in 2016, where we can look at these spreads. But models essentially, they just take things that we know and you hypothesize things that we want to find out. And so I'm using models in a way to understand that spread throughout Southwool when people got to these regions. And we have a pretty good idea of where their embarkation points were, where people went. So modeling the deep pass is actually a simple question, but very computationally complex. So we may understand quite a lot of things about how people move. If I were to grab a hiking guidebook, it would tell me if a trail was easy, moderate, or hard. And how they're doing that is essentially by using Tobler's hiking function, which I show you at the very bottom of the screen here, which is essentially looking at how difficult the walking is going up a slope versus going on flat ground. Usually out of the box GIS approaches use Tobler's hiking function to say, how hard would it be? How many calories would you expend going from point A to point B? And so you can calculate that by looking at the topography. Most people, um, when looking at uh, modeling least cost paths, are doing that. Freshetti did something different. He looked at essentially water flow models to say, where would people have accumulated if we're looking at people moving throughout the Silk Roads? Um, and it's somewhat more similar to what I did. But um, these kinds of models are pretty simple because you're using such a large area. It's computationally complex to be able to calculate how people are moving that um, by necessity, it's been difficult to ask and answer very large questions. So Devin White, who's the director of autonomous sensing at Sandia National Labs, developed this workflow called From Everywhere to Everywhere, where he originally looked at modeling trade routes in Oaxaca, Mexico. And From Everywhere to Everywhere looks at essentially calculating the cost between two cells across the entire landscape. So we're literally looking at the cost of traveling from everywhere to everywhere. And so Devin, I've known Devin for quite a while and we've been interested in asking these kinds of questions on a larger landscape and where we can use more ethnographic information to refine our data better. And so we teamed up to begin with his from everywhere to everywhere workflow to look at the peopling of Sahul. So essentially, oh dear, I had no idea that I still had the sound of that. Can you guys hear that? I'm so sorry. All right, well, essentially what we are seeing is, um, you would have seen a beautiful video of people walking through the sands, but I can hear the wind. So I'm going to stop this at the moment. <laughs> so no video, I apologize. But essentially what we're doing is we're bringing in different kinds of equations to look at the cost of traveling between two cells and looking at that on an entire landscape level. So we begin with Tobler's hiking function, which is how fast can you go on a slope? Can you go up a slope at a, a quick pace or a slow pace? Is it going to be very costly metabolically for you? The US Army, in, in the interest of moving troops across large spaces, have um, done quite a bit of calculations of what costs are going to be. And so we essentially brought in many other differential equations to look at costs of traveling throughout the landscape. So this is the backbone of this model. And then we have a few other things that we're going to talk about. So the, the second equation looks at Mo movement on flat or uphill surfaces. And the third equation looks at movement downhill. So movement downhill does cause costs on your body. And so by looking at all of these things, we're actually doing a better calculation of what costs would be traveling throughout a landscape. And then the final one is looking at that metabolic rate. So remember I said women, men, and children all have different metabolic needs. Well, we need to use those for calculating the cost throughout an entire landscape. So here, 
we're just looking at these within a realistic geographic information system backbone. So this is the base of our model that we began with before we started doing some more fancy um, modeling. So we can take all that information, we build in a topographic map, and then this is just a null model just to explain what I mean. So we, we start with input and embarkation, input embarkation and destination points, basically. So that's on the left where we have these 20, 25 um, red dots that we look at the costs among all those red dots. And so then that middle looks at what is the cost to get from each dot to each dot. And so we're looking at the cost throughout the entire landscape. Then what we do is we have essentially a counter in every single cell that says how often would these paths have been chosen by our imaginary agents that we pour onto the landscape. And that then gives us the most traveled paths. And so in this null model here where I, that I'm showing you, on the right, those that are highlighted in red, those were the most chosen paths of this dummy model, essentially. So we begin with that. But of course we know people are not completely economic agents. They're not always going to choose the most simple paths. So that's where I think things start getting interesting. So building our model up, we needed to bring in some different kinds of data planes. So first, there was no digital elevation model for Sahul. So what we did was there is some very fine scale mapping of the ocean floor. And so essentially what we did is we drained the oceans to the continental extent 70,000 years ago. And we then were able to stitch these together and create a full digital elevation model of Sahul. Of course, in these models, we're you know, going to the ocean floor. So we're you know, not including the vast coral reefs around Australia now. But this gives us a general idea of what the continent of Sahul would look like. So that then provides us with this full scale model where we can use those initial equations. What would be the cost, just metabolically, of traveling throughout Sahul? Remember when I talked about how people look to the horizons to orient themselves? Well, we decided that we needed to have a visual prominence layer. So what this is, is essentially creating, we have a window that moves throughout the entire continent that says when you're standing here, what can you see when you look up? And we move that throughout the entire continent and we created the largest visual prominence layer ever created. And here you can see that the dark blue are the very low points and the yellow are the very high points. You can see the highlands of New Guinea are very well highlighted. But one of the things that you can see is that Australia, Kahul, is a pretty deflated and ancient landscape. But even so, rocky ridges would still be critical when you're moving throughout a landscape to be able to orient yourself. For anyone who has walked doing wind farm surveys in Wyoming, you know exactly what I mean. You look to wherever you can find a tiny little horizon point to help orient yourself to be sure you're going in the right direction. So we have this entire visual prominence layer that we can use as one of our layers in our model. Modern hydrology, of course, does not extend to the coasts. And so we needed to model the rivers and arroyos with a probabilistic modeling to go all the way to the coastline of Sahul. And then of course we have used um, paleo data on lakes and rivers. There's a pretty good modeling within Australia Sahul of what paleo lakes and rivers looked like. And so we were able to combine those together to create a new layer of rivers and arroyos that go throughout the entire continent. And all of this, by the way, is uh, open access for anyone who wants it. So then when you do the model, you run a combination of variables and weightings, you get paths out, and you ask which one seemed to make the most sense. And I know that putting tables up in a talk is totally verboten, but it's, I think, the easiest way to show you what we did, where we have to have a null model, where we have a grid of people kind of moving across and just looking at those metabolic rates. We look at coastlines to water. We look at whether or not um, people are moving between reliable water sources. We look at using the visual cues and we build this up 
from a parsimonious null model to more complicated models as we go forward. So then we can just essentially pour people onto the landscape and see where they go. This is just a visualization to show you what it would look like. This isn't our actual model running. But essentially, as people move into one of the embarkation points when they come from Sunda, where do they spread throughout? Notice that even though I'm trained in archaeology, I haven't talked about archaeology at all. And that's because as a good modeler, I need to make sure that I am leaving something for myself to be able to test against. And so this model is all based on basic understanding of human metabolic rates, human needs for walking, the landscape, the visual prominence. And I forgot to mention that we use Binford's constructing frames of reference to look at the average uh, height and metabolic needs of a 25 year old woman as, uh, as our modeled travelers. So we model all of this, but then we're going to compare this against the archeological data. So we compiled a new data set of most reliable old archeological dates for Australia and New Guinea and Tasmania and compiled these together to create something to compare our models against. So we wanted to see, do our models correspond to some of the old archeological sites or not? But because our models create networks, create paths, we needed a new way to compare point processes to, excuse me, to a network. Usually when you're comparing points, whether they're comparing points to something and seeing whether they're completely spatially random or they were generated with some kind of thing that made them be where they are, you compare points to points using a completely spatially randomization. Um, and we couldn't do that because we had networks. So we came up with new statistics, which again, you can access all of this open access, which is a modification of Ripley's L test to treat the network as a single vector and then be able to do a completely spatially random randomization of the archeological sites to compare whether or not our networks correspond well to um, the archeological sites or not. From all of this, we modeled 125 billion pathways and we need to look at the most probable pathways and compare them against what we actually know about South Wool during the last glacial maximum. So the output of all of these things looks like this. So you do have a path in every single cell of this entire map, um, but what you're seeing, those very red lines are the most frequently chosen paths throughout the area. And you can see some places, if I were to zoom in on that lower right, just above Tasmania, you see a lot of different paths. And then you see some places where it's what we call super highways in our paper. Our modeled people are choosing those quite frequently. We also see that in our models, those models that do not take into account the need for fresh water and the desire to orient yourself based on high landscape places, those perform very poorly. I should note that within that um, visual prominence layer, it's not that people are walking directly at the mountain, it's that it kind of weights their decisions. They walk kind of near it and keep going and then look at the next high place. When we see all of these, we see these areas corresponding very well to ancient archeological sites. So what this tells us is that after generating 125 billion pathways, we have some idea of where people went. And it looks like people were trying to maximize water, do wayfinding with the topography, and these then correspond best with our archeological data. Some sites we see do not correspond near these pathways. And so, this tells us a couple of things. One, maybe our model is wrong, but two, there's not a lot of archeological perspection in some areas. And it has pointed to areas where archeologists could potentially go to look to see if there are ancient archeological sites. And people are actually doing surveys in some of these, these places now, places that we identified in our paper. Also, if you notice um, the picture on the right is kind of mapping 
the super highways over an atlas from the 1800s that is an exploration map. There are trade routes that seem to correspond to some of the, the highways, the super highways that we identify, trade in greenstone or paturi tobacco. And these may relate to stories that people learn that help them to move throughout regions that potentially link to some of our pathways. Early people, it seems, used a set of fundamental rules that were associated with physiological capacity, attraction to landscape features, and freshwater distribution. I already said all of this. <laughs> we should look at especially some of these areas where we're not seeing archeological sites, but they are doing that. And I'm excited about what's coming forward. There may be implications of this. We know that megafauna went extinct pretty quickly after the arrival of Aboriginal people. And perhaps the stigmergic effects of these pathways and the rapid movement um, helped facilitate uh, the ability to hunt some of these um, animals that were also be experiencing climatic changes. So what these models don't tell us is what the experience of migration would have been. It tells us that people could have gone, come in, it shows us pathways that people could have moved through, but it doesn't tell us about the novel, exciting, challenging, and scary ways that migration would be. But what people would have done is you would have tried to do anything you could to control your experience as you're moving through a region. As you come across megafauna, as you come across new plants that you don't understand, that you've never used before. And so you're trying to build them into your vocabulary of the flora and fauna that are a part of your world. And so what these models can do is they can lead us toward understanding these kinds of migrations. So this is just the first step in these studies. The team is working to understand connectivity as we move out of the last glacial maximum and into the Holocene. We want to understand how certain groups were connected to a larger landscape. So we see these pathways, we see these trade routes where people indeed linking themselves across this larger landscape. I think about um, Ben Fitzhugh's work of looking at long scale stories to connect people in the Kuril Islands to make sure that if something happens, you have people who you can connect with, people who you've never met, that maybe the last time your ancestors came into contact with them was four or five generations ago. There are stories that link Aboriginal people on the landscape and there are these deep stigmergic effects of the paths that we are seeing in our models. And notice that I am um, juxtaposing this against a painting. So this is a painting by Helen Sampson of Puntawari, which is a representation of an area rich with water and stars. So Marty Millie artists paint these traditional landscapes. And a lot of what they paint are essentially maps. So this painting on the right is by Lavina Biljabu, and it's by an area on the canning stock route. Um, picture on the left kind of shows you what the canning stock route looks like. And this idea of painting essentially a digital elevation model is part of um, Mardu Lifeway. So Nyalanka Taylor, who I spent quite a bit of time with in that uh, period in 2017, uh, she says this uh, best, of course, when Mardu paint, it's like a map. Mardu draws stories on the ground and on the canvas and all the circles and lines, there are the hunting areas and different waters and tracks where people used to walk. And some of you can't cross like boundaries. So nowadays you see a colorful painting and wonder what it is. But that's how Mardu tells stories long ago. It's not just a lovely painting, it's a story and a song line and a history and everything that goes with it. So these representations that they make today are representations of the things that they would have walked through. And one more, which is by Mary Rowlands of Marble Bar to give you an idea with a drone photo that uh, we took against a painting of a similar area. So people migrate. People have these physiological capacities that enable them to move through a landscape. They conceptualize these landscapes and as they confront new places, it's novel and it's exciting, but as they move through 
these things are embedded within our cognitive capacity. So if you're interested in reading more about the paper, I basically went through this paper that was um, recently indexed by Nature Human Behavior, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions. And like I said, um, all of our uh, data planes and everything are freely available. So with the 15 minutes I have left, I'm moving forward to talk a little more about the human ecosystem connection in Australia. And these things I think interrelate because we're looking at the ways that humans embed themselves into novel landscapes and the ways that ecosystems impact people and people impact the ecosystem and the environment. So I mentioned early on that people lived traditional existence until 1964. What happened in 1964 is that the Australian government wanted to test missiles in what they thought was an empty region of Australia. So they shot a test missile out there and flew over and realized there were people there. And there's this lovely documentary called Contact, not the Jodie Foster movie, um, but a beautiful documentary that came out about 10, 15 years ago that looks at that initial contact in 1964 as Mardu were removed to cattle stations and missions on the periphery of their traditional lands. So between 1960s and the 1980s, several small animals in this region went extinct, such as the mala, the rufous hair wallaby on the right, which was ubiquitous in the arid zones and then was extinct in the mainland by the 1970s. Now, why did this happen? Well, what happened in that amount of time is that people stopped burning. People in the winter time, especially, burn these small scale fires to create a patchy landscape um, to be able to hunt. And so these one to five hectare fires are um, very critical for the patchiness of the landscape. Uh, my postdoctoral advisor, Rebecca Bird, uh, has written extensively on this. But what we wanted to learn was whether or not we could understand the extinctions of these small bodied mammals by looking at what happens when you remove Mardu from the food web. So it seems that people were keeping animals in this vulnerable region alive. People were in Australia since 70, 60 to 70,000 years ago, and in the Western desert since 30,000 years ago, suggesting this long-term coevolution between people and ecosystem. Things people do in these ecosystems are critical for the function of that ecosystem. Several of my colleagues, um, Rebecca Bird, Dale Nimmo, for example, uh, work on understanding how certain animals prefer different recovery stages of fires. And so if you have a patchy landscape, each of these organisms can enjoy the different growth stages of those areas. But if you take that away, if everything grows homogeneously and then everything burns from a lightning fire in the summer and it comes through and it kind of destroys everything, then you're modifying the habitat that people were integral in creating. So by looking at Mardu's effects within the food web, we can look at potentially how um, they were making the ecosystem more sustainable for a larger number of taxa. So I had previously done work on food webs. So this is, people have been working on food webs for a long time. This is the first food web that um, first really operationalized one from 1880 by Lorenzo Camarano. Um, and this looks essentially at, it, it's a, called something like on the mutual destruction of the species. It's beautiful. Um, but we look at these nutrient flows throughout the ecosystem. So what a food web is, is essentially you have a plant that grows that gets eaten by a, an herbivore and then the herbivore gets eaten by a carnivore. And then once we connect many of these relationships together, you get something that looks like this. So this is from my first published food web in 2017. It's the first highly resolved terrestrial food web, including humans ever published. Um, and this looks at the ancestral Pueblo food web. Now what you're seeing here, those red dots on the bottom, those are primary producers or plants. The orange balls, those are the herbivores. And then as you go up, you get true carnivores. That red arrow is pointing toward people 
so with the Pueblo Food Web, I was able to show how embedded these farmers were in their environments, even though they were farming maize, beans, and squash. What food webs can tell us is something about community structure. So how many plants do you have? How many carnivores do you have? You can look at the links among them. You can understand things about community stability. So if there is a highly connected animal, like uh, the one that's highlighted a little bit in white in the picture there, what happens if we remove that animal, if it goes extinct? Does the food web just stay or does it unravel? And we can look at energy and nutrient flow in ecosystems. So how does energy from these primary producers get all the way up to the true carnivores? So by creating these food webs, modeling what Mardu eat and what all the other animals in the Western desert eat, we can have an idea of what that looks like. So I spent time um, with field guides and with Mardu asking them about what they ate pre-1960s, asking them about these extinct animals. There are still relic populations on islands and so they're very well studied. So I have ideas about what they ate, but being able to work with people who have very intimate knowledge um, of this creates a, a better understanding of what the ecosystem is. And so the pre-1964 ecosystem looks like this. So on the left is exactly what you just looked at with um, the Pueblo, where we have red dots on the bottom, those are the plants. We have um, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores as we go up the food web. The white ball, those are Mardu. I am kind of pulled them out so you can see they're very embedded in the ecosystem. On the right, I'm just showing you how embedded they are. So connectivity sorted is how many things do you eat plus how many things eat you? And we can see that Mardu are very highly connected. They are in fact, the most highly connected taxa in the ecosystem. But what does this look like directly if we look at Mardu in 1964? So we can pull out essentially everything that they ate and look at those weights. That's the representation of the thick arrows. And you can see these are sorted according to plants, mammals, um, birds, herpetofauna, etc. You'll notice that there are already some invasive species that are represented in pre-1964, such as the camel on the very bottom. Those are not native to Australia. They were introduced by some enterprising British person who thought that every desert should have camels. But you can see that people are feeding on a vast array of things. So if we then compare this against when Mardu came back after the late 1980s, we see a shift in their diets to almost 80% of their diets being represented by store-bought goods. That's what the flour and ham mean here. They, didn't, they don't just eat flour and ham, of course. This is just a representation of store-bought goods. They're still hunting, especially uh, goanna lizards. Um, they're foraging for some plants and hunting for some mammals. But notice that if we compare that to this, you have a huge constriction and we have a couple extinctions. So we know that it changes, but to be able to compare whether these changes are normal, we have to simulate the network. So to do this, I employed niche models to examine how the changes are statistically meaningful. So these simulations essentially take the 1964 food web and look at rearranging the links in an erdos renyi randomization process to look at what random extinctions would look like. We know extinctions just happen. It's part of being an organism. But we want to understand whether the services that Marty provided um, helped to buffer those extinctions. So these niche models can help us determine the structure and stability of the food web. So these graphs essentially tell you um, what's going on. So the orange circles, that is that 1964 food web. And then the red lines around them, that's the um, standard deviation essentially. So that's that randomization. So anything that falls within there is to be predicted. This is within the idea of what would happen. Anything that falls outside of there is not predicted based upon the structure of that 1964 food web. So you can see that 
there are some statistics that are very unpredictable and some that aren't. So what these data end up telling me is that there are certain things that Mardu do that help to knit that ecosystem together. So the ecosystem, in fact, is pretty stable um, to some perturbations. But when Mardu are removed, there are certain things that they do that are absolutely critical. For one, they dampen predators like large snakes and goanna, who are especially um, voracious against these small bodied mammals in the summer, the vulnerable summer months when we have those large scale fires coming through. So this is one way that removal of people was very detrimental to the ecosystem. It essentially resulted in a meso predator release. Mardu helped keep these environments patchy, which then created niches for some of these organisms that they that Mardu hunted. Um, and so by removing Mardu, we see that the food web does begin unraveling. This was all published in my 2019 paper with um, Rebecca Bird and Doug Bird. Um, and if you have any questions about it, I'm also, of course, happy to answer them. So things that we see in both of these studies that the, is that there are deep feedbacks between ecosystems and people. We can see that people provide certain functions for ecosystems and that people do interesting and novel things. But also some of the things that we can see is that things that people did 70,000, 30,000, 1,000 years ago are still very similar to what people do today. And so by understanding our place in the ecosystem, we can better understand our sustainability today and into the future. By looking at the ways that we provide services to ecosystems, and by looking at the physiological capacities that we have within these places, we can better make predictions for people going uh, into the future. So the From Everywhere to Everywhere models are being used, have been used, um, for looking at migration of people in uh, climatic scenarios, because we know that our physiological capacity is the same as how people were 70,000 years ago. And so by being able to model people coming into Sahul into an unfamiliar environment, we're able essentially to extrapolate forward. The same with these ecosystem studies. I'm comparing something from the 60s to now, but we can easily look at what happens if we remove people or we remove these critical plants because they are, in fact, um, they're vulnerable to climate change. We can look at the ways that our decisions today can be beneficial or detrimental to the future. And so in this way, I think that archaeology can save the world because we can look at the past as a learning example to be able to go forward. So for these specific um, bits today, I need to thank Sean Ulm, Joe McDonald, Mike Price, and Artemy Kulchinski for video footage um, that helped to, I think, uh, illustrate some of what I was talking to, and everyone who helped contribute to the research, and um, to my many collaborators who I've worked with um, throughout the years. Thank you very much for helping to, um, helping me to think these thoughts through. And of course, my funders, and I believe I am right on time. So thank you very much. Fantastic, Stephanie. Thank you very, very much for a very stimulating talk there. So um, just while people are getting their thoughts together, just to remind you that you can put um, questions to Stephanie into the Q&A box there. We've already got uh, one or two questions and our panelists as well may uh, come online and ask you questions as well. So um, first question we've got uh, in the Q&A um, asks, um, submerged archaeological sites um, off the coast of Florida, for example, indicate significant settlements. Yeah. How do you handle the bias of archaeological sites that exist um, in preserve versus uh, sites that are in more difficult to reach locations? Well, I think so we actually have a couple of sites that are represented here that you can see on the map that you're staring at that are currently submerged. Um, and I think that what 
these models suggest are that we do, as we all know this, we need to spend more time looking at the submerged coastlines because we know that the coastlines we have today are not the same as the coastlines that we had many, many years ago. Um, there is always bias in the archeological record based on where people have spent time working. Um, but I think that one of the strengths of this approach of looking at the geophysical attributes and the physiological attributes of people is that it kind of highlights some of the places where we should work um, if we are interested in finding these old archeological sites. Uh, I am excited to, let's say in five years, update this research and do a new statistical analysis to see as more data come forward, whether or not these pathways do hold true. Um, and I have been reached out to by a couple of different um, researchers, some looking at the arrival of people into North America, some looking at the spread of hominins throughout Eurasia, um, to be able to use this as another data point when we have things like genomic evidence, linguistic evidence, and archaeological evidence. Uh, I guess kind of I got I've got a couple of kind of follow up related questions to that. Um, okay, so one one thing I guess another thing that changes can be other things to do with the environment, and um, so I'm thinking of an example of uh, the Bantu expansion in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, kind of recent work has shown this kind of uh, basically what, what is now the kind of the massive rainforest in Central Africa where they they think that due to climatic differences actually when the Bantu were migrating there was a, a kind of a corridor in that in that forest and that's kind of linked to um, you know, kind of the pathway through which we we kind of infer that the Bantu traveled kind of fits nicely with that with that corridor. Um, so for, I guess first of all are there um, those kind of uh, potential changes in vegetation or other things of, other than just you know topographic differences that might affect the, the rate of movement and uh, in in this system? Yeah so there is going to be a different rate of movement in deserts versus forests, for sure. One of the challenges with the 70,000 year date is um, being able to reliably project backwards uh, ecosystems. However, two of my co-authors, Corey Bradshaw and Fred Faltre, have been working with Loveclim models for using um, ecological data. And this is where one of our next step projects is in using these pathways as potential corridors with an agent-based model and um, including some more of this ecological data. A very interesting thing though is that in the deserts of Australia today and into the Holocene, where you walk depends on where was recently burned. And so that is going to change on a seven to 17 year time scale, depending upon where we're looking. Um, because walking through spinifex, it's basically like a uh, sagebrush, just a little spikier with silica tips. It's pretty terrible. Um, and so you try to avoid it, but those things are going to change paths by a couple hundred meters to the left and right um, as burning happens throughout those the cycles of those. And so this is to say that, yes, Ecosystems definitely do matter. And this is some of the stuff we want to do going forward with Holocene where we can model ecosystems more reliably. But for the very long scale um, projected backward data, we made the decision that essentially we'd be modeling forest desert as big chunks and that may not make a huge difference on the large scale migration, but it might change things on little wavy bits. Okay, yeah, interesting. So different time scales potentially important to some of these changes and differences. Well, and also with these models, we wanted to do the most parsimonious null model. And so this is, I find it incredibly exciting, but I also think it's going to be the most 
boring of the models that we do because it essentially is looking at people's physiological capacity and things we can model with people that long ago, which is looking at your topography and looking for water. And those are still homo economicus. And we know that's not true. We know these rich dreaming stories. We know there are boundaries as Milonka talked about um, in that quote about the paintings, that there are places we can go and can't go. He said, these are things that we're working toward as we move more recently. And then it's with models, it's kind of, you have this null model, you do something more recent. And then if our, our ecological models, maybe we can go back again. And it's, you know, a oscillating thing, um, which will keep me and my PhD students busy for a very long time. <laughs> yes, yeah, I think you've got a, a, lot, uh, a lot of ways to take it, fantastic. Uh, Sergey, you've got a hand up. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I wonder if uh, there are any data or if uh, you have any ideas on the actual uh, dispersal. Uh, I mean, um, is, was it something like we would move like a little bit every generation or we will go like long distance dispersal? And uh, if it's long distance dispersal, uh, and, uh, how would we know where to go? And, and, and things like that. And also, it's not just topography, like when you're coming to completely, well, not completely, but to a new environment, presumably we had to learn new things, right? There should have been some kind of cultural evolution. Uh, so is anything known about this uh, and how adding these uh, factors would change kind of your understanding of what's going on? Yeah, you bring up, um very good point. This shows the roots, but not the rates of expansion. And so in this way, it is going, it is the basis of um, agent based model that I'm working on with my colleagues, where we're trying to look at those rates of expansion. Um, there was a contemporaneous paper that came out um, by my colleague Corey Bradshaw that looked at using cellular automata models, and how high of a population you would need for people to spread throughout the Sahul. And so we're essentially building on that to look at the rates of expansion along these routes. Um, the quick answer to your question is it's not, you know, within a short generation that people are everywhere. It takes quite a long time. And we do think that people were in the continent for tens of thousands of years before they made it with really huge fidelity into places like the Western desert because of these cultural factors of learning how to live within these environments. Um, once they get there, they're beautiful garden environments. People know where to hunt, where to find water, where to gather. It's not a, a scary desert like I think a lot of us um, think about, um, but it does take a very long time for that kind of information to gather. And um, Sergey, if you would like to write to the National Science Foundation, we are applying for funding to do exactly this kind of modeling so you can tell them to approve my grant. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Pete's got a question. Actually, I've got two related questions. First, uh, have you thought about, or has anybody thought about modeling the uh, uh, the megafaunal extinction. And yeah. The, go ahead. Sorry, no, you, you asked your second question. I'm sorry. And the second question is uh, the uh, uh, last glacial was extremely variable climatically. And, and so the Holocene is really a revol ecological revolution, I would think. Uh, yeah. What people were doing before about 12,000 years ago and what they were doing after 12,000 years ago is probably radically different. Is that? A reasonable uh, speculation. So to your question about the megafaunal extinction, Fred Saltre has a paper that came out in 20, early 2020 that looks at modeling the ecological needs for megafauna coupled with the climatic change and the arrival of people um, to say what of these um, led to their extinction. And I believe the punchline of the paper is I mean, yes, it all was bad for them. Um, 
And so one of the things that I am excited about with working with Fred is looking at not only the plant ecology, but being able to look at these kinds of questions more readily with the roots and the rates and looking at what the dates are for the probable extinctions of megafauna and um, whether or not that corresponds to some of these spread questions. Um, as for your second question, yes, things were dramatically different by the time the Holocene came around. And we see distinct language groups um, arising in these areas. We see um, really robust trade networks. We see people probably staying within areas, migrating around there, but not going throughout the entire continent. And so some of the things that I am interested in looking at are especially these dreaming stories, which link people across the long, um, large axes of Australia that are shared among different language groups. And these may correspond to some of these older pathways. And how do these early migration episodes relate to people later in the Holocene? And what are the ways that we can see connections between the ancestors of the people in the Holocene and the unique and different things that were going on then with, as you mentioned, with the ecological changes, with the climatic changes and the commensurate uh, changes in people's culture. Um, and I think that the models I presented today are very much so null models, um, but that they can lead to some of these bigger questions. Sergey. Uh, what, what about uh, genetics and what about population sizes? Can you use genetic data to kind of see uh, potential paths? I, I know that people who study uh, migration out of Africa we, uh, use computational models of dispersal and kind of identify uh, potential paths and also we reconstruct somehow population densities. Yeah, so is it possible to do something like this? One of the people who I'm talking with about applying these approaches is a geneticist um, working in Europe, looking at the, um, the connections of different groups of people across Eurasia. Um, I am not a geneticist. Um, I can read it and understand to a degree what they're doing, but I think that the combination of these kinds of um, models is potentially revolutionary I know that there have been challenges with looking at genetic data to interpret um, peopling events or population events um, based on how they're calibrated. And so I think that when we can bring together different kinds of models to be able to ask these things from different viewpoints, that then we can start to really get a better picture of what was going on. There are definitely stories of early people in Sahul based on some of these genetic data or linguistic data. Um, and we didn't use that in our models because we wanted to look at this within a things we definitely can control for in this model and completely understand and build up from that parsimony. And so I'm excited to look at where I can work with people who have genetic data. Um, and see if these kinds of approaches of really modeling, what are the physiological constraints? How do people move? How do people create these artificial boundaries across these large spaces and stay within those so that we get this kind of genetic drift? So we get these diverging populations. What happens and why? I think that would be very interesting. But again, the caveat is I am not a geneticist. And so that is something that I uh, partner with people for. Thanks. Are there any um, uh, challenges with getting genetic samples or using genetic samples for addressing those kind of questions with you know, indigenous indigenous people? And because there's a strong indigenous um, rights movement in in Australia around you know, use of biological samples, for example, and and those kind of things. Exactly. Hmm. Um, I want to make sure that. The work that I do, no matter where I'm working, is partnering with the descendant communities and asking the kinds of questions that are respectful to all the communities who are working together. 
And there are ways of weaving this knowledge together of Western scientific practice and indigenous knowledge. But I think that it requires a lot of conversation. Um, and I think that for me, the questions that I find really interesting generally tend to veer away from things that would be incredibly controversial. When I teach undergraduates about um, NAGPRA in the Americas, I try to get them to think about their own grandparents and visiting their grandparents' graves and ask them how they would feel, you know, if somebody came and visited grandma for a different purpose. And so by, by approaching the question that way, I think that it can get at some of these more fraught questions of using genetic data that is not your own. And so that is a very long-winded way of saying that um, for me, being able to build these models up and working with descendant communities about questions that I think are important to me and to them enables us to ask really important scientific questions while also honoring important relationships and developing those relationships through time. And I guess on, on that on that point, do are there particular questions that the Matu have have said that they're interested in, um, um, particularly around things like I guess kind of the the function of of, uh, of burning and uh, and and its ecological consequences? Did they talk about these things in the same way that your kind of analyses are revealing? Mardu, when you ask them why Mala went extinct, it says because we stopped hunting them. They all went away because our function in the dreaming world, we have to hunt them. And that's how the ecosystem survives. And so being able to ask questions about the ecology and about food and about the ways that their ancestors walked throughout this landscape, um, because migration is a very big thing, is um, I think one way to get at these questions in a Western scientific practice. Um, and so I'm always excited when I'm able to ask questions that I think are very complementary to the deep knowledge that they all have. Mm -hmm. And uh, another kind of question that was um, that came to mind when thinking about migrations and connecting that to indigenous uh, histories. Uh, so you talked about so people in um, migration is a part of indigenous histories and, and oral histories and things that people talk about. Um, I remember reading uh, about a paper that was uh, arguing that um, indigenous people, and I think another part of Australia, were talking about kind of, um, they had stories about flood events. Um, and these uh, researchers were arguing, you know, you could tie that into something that was happening 9,000 years ago. So yeah, do you have, and you know, from other migrations, I know there's going to people talk about homelands and we're able to kind of, you know, identify where those homelands might be. Um, do you have a sense that some of those oral histories that can tie into the kind of modeling that, that you do and uh, can they be revealed or kind of, can you strengthen arguments about where, where are those homelands might have been, for example? Absolutely. Um, and that's some of the stuff that we are hoping to do as we go forward with this work with the Holocene work, um, really working with those dreaming stories um, and looking at those dreaming pathways that come out song lines. Um, because these kinds of migrational stories are very integral um, to their deep religious and um, everyday practice. And I think that it's the first time after we did the analyses of the maps against the archeological sites, and we saw those big tracks going through the center, I had to pull up an atlas and say, I know that I've seen a map that somebody drew a line saying, it looks like Paturi went this way. Um, and being able to link these actual trades where we see something appearing here coming from here to these pathways, I think is very exciting. I think it also shows that people are connected. 
we like to think about modern people as being very connected with our highway systems and our mobile phones and all that. And we think about people in the past as not being so, but they were. And they had ways of communicating with groups of disparate people across a very long way. And I think that this shows that these physiological capacities of movement are really built into who we are as a species and our ability to maintain relationships across long distances, whether that is trading something important or walking a very long way um, to connect to people for marriage partners or you know whatever. People in the past were not isolated in small areas. They were connected to a larger group than I think we give them credit for. And I think that that's part of why this work is exciting. Make one final call for um, questions <laughs> on the on the Q and A function, um, but uh, in the meantime, I just wanted to to loop back to a question about kind of um, past species and the kind of the impact of of humans. Do we have good archaeological data about past food webs? And uh, partly that's related to uh, um, the point that Pete mentioned about kind of the hu potential human disturbance uh, on these food webs. So do we have an idea about what food webs were like before humans and any potential impact on, on them afterwards or even other changes that might have happened over the last 40,000 years? So um, I direct the, this project called the Archaeoecology Project, where we're looking at the human place in food webs from six different societies worldwide. This is one of them. We're also working in French Polynesia, working um, with LDK to Neolithic cultures at the Swifterbont area of the Netherlands, Northwest Coast, uh, Pueblo Southwest, and Iceland. Um, and looking at how people insert themselves into ecosystems, how they make them more robust in the case of Mardu, or how they do unravel them uh, in the case of some of the other places. And with, with Mardu, it's hard because we don't have a super fantastic understanding of what um, the ecology was like 40,000 years ago. But I do point to some paleo food web data from the British Shale, where we're able to recreate paleo food webs based on body size, bite marks, looking at some of these preserved organisms. And so some things that I'm working on going forward um, is looking at the ways to look at food webs pre-people or look at comparing um, different early hominin species to look at how we interact within our ecosystem versus other hominins. And look at that from this ecological perspective where when one thing changes, when we have predictable extinctions, what happens? How do things rearrange and how how do humans really manipulate that? Humans are incredibly smart. We are incredibly omnivorous. We're able to change what we do. We're versatile. And so the things that we do are different than a lot of other organisms, not every other organism, but a lot of other organisms. Um, in the Mardu food web, the only other organism that is very highly connected is the camel, which is introduced, which I think is pretty interesting that one of the ways that it has been able to infiltrate and its populations are huge in Australia and there are um, there are drives to kill camels. People fly in helicopters and shoot them from the air because they are becoming this crazy invasive species because they in a lot of ways can manipulate their environments in a similar way to people can. And um, so looking at looking at pre-human ecosystems would require understanding what organisms are there, looking at that body size of what they're likely eating and creating that, which we can do, um, just like uh, the Cambrian food web. And then looking at when people move in and what do we predict people would do? How would they eat? And that would be um, in a similar way of doing this based upon body size and uh, predictions based on what we know about humans today but we don't have good archaeology for it. Now in the ancestral Pueblo Southwest, we have time slices that I've compared and I'm working on another paper of comparing those of what do people do over time. And then in the paper that I had come out with Philip Verhagen earlier this year, that looks at that LBK Neolithic transition in Swifterbund. 
we can see archaeologically when people come in and they're hunting and gathering versus when they start domesticating, what does that mean for the ecosystem? And stay tuned for the work in Iceland, because uh, this is an interesting case where we not only have a very late colonization by people, um, but we also have written records. So we know exactly what people were doing. We know their laws as they came in of deciding how to deal with um, common pool resources. And so this is a really interesting and weird food web because we can look at it archeologically. We can see what happens in archeo really well excavated and dated sites. And we can look at what they wrote about it and see people responding in real time to changes in uh, climate and changes in their behaviors related to the prediction of when certain organisms will come back, um, eider ducks, seals, sea lions, those kinds of things. Cool, I'll have to look out for that when it, uh, when it emerges, fantastic. Um, okay, brilliant. So um, I think we can say uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, for a fantastic uh, talk and uh, very interesting answers to, to questions. Um, so say so next week, uh, we will have a talk by Mathis van Vielen on the evolution of morality and the role of commitment. But uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, once again. And uh, we uh, hope to see you in the audience uh, next week and in future weeks too. So yeah. thank you thank very you much, for everybody. The invitation. And thank yeah. you also for posting these on YouTube because it's been nice for the weeks when I can't attend to be able to come back to the interesting talk. Yeah, well, yeah. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Cheers.